people in the chat today. Fantastic. Uh, feel free to continue to ask questions as we go through this event. We have a another uh, great session for you all today. Um, also, for those that may have been here on our last session, we are doing a very special promotion for those of you that have attended this meeting. And look forward to the end for that as well. All right. Well, to get started, this month, we are talking about the language of cybersecurity. Um, I'm Nate Medeiros, the product manager of OpsPod Academy, and we cover so many different kinds of technologies, uh, so many different kinds of challenges within the critical infrastructure ecosystem that it can be daunting at times to decide what kind of solutions fit with what kind of problems. And when we get into complicated environments and complicated environments, especially those that are segmented uh, through either you know manufacturing, critical infrastructure, um, uh, power facilities, or water treatment, uh, nuclear, we see a a lot of solutions working together to protect ultimately one critical asset or process. And in this modern era, there are so many technologies that an IT administrator, for example, or security operations um, manager would need to keep tabs on. And that can cause uh, fatigue in its own right. So what can we do about that? Well, one of the biggest missions that this company, OpSWAT, first set out for was to discover, uh, in, in the words of, of uh, Benny, our CEO, the language of cybersecurity. And really, what I gather from that message is the ability for all of these solutions to have a functional way to communicate with one another. Because ultimately, they're working together to accomplish a single task, which is to protect whatever asset it's designed to protect. And if it's protecting the email component versus the removable media component versus the internet component, it's an organization that needs to be protected with various different solutions working to do those things. And if we want to centralize and view all those elements, there needs to be some kind of synergistic communication between this fundamental concept of cybersecurity and protection. When things get left in the dust because they have one admin somewhere uh, that has the password to go in and change the configuration, that's a solution that lies outside of this language of cybersecurity. And even the aspect of keeping tabs on the solutions themselves, keeping tabs on password management, uh, you know, ultimately, it, it is all encompassing when we're talking about security, especially for critical infrastructure. So what are some ways that we can address that? Well, standardization is a big one. Uh, we had a webinar a couple months ago about a protocol called ICAP. And this is a um, very intuitive way to incorporate this into many kinds of solutions where you have a, it's designed for HTTP handoff, essentially, where HTTP traffic comes in, you have this ICAP protocol, which hands off uh, the contents of the HTTP to be processed somewhere else, and then give a response and pass back nicely into whatever workflow that originally existed in. Uh, we're not gonna be going through a web uh, ICAP uh, demonstration today, since we had already covered that. But what I want to cover, particularly around this concept of the language of cybersecurity, and this will be the first time we actually go through a live demo um, on these uh, Academy webinar um, sessions, so I'm excited for that. Uh, we're gonna be going through interacting with, with an API, specifically interacting with the Meta Defender Core API. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull, share my screen here. And 
I'll go ahead and pull this up. Okay, uh, let me move you guys over to the side so I can see the chat. And once again, feel free to uh, ask questions as we go through this. Um, we're going to be covering some pretty exciting things from the perspective of integration. So um, I have the chat up here on the side. So feel free to ask questions as we go through this. I see we actually have a QA already. Let's actually address some of these before we dive into this VM. Uh, certification. So we get this question um, quite often for these webinars. These webinars are uh, free service webinars. Uh, and the certifications that we provide are through our online courses through Offset Academy. Um, we have a not a certification to offer you guys, but a special surprise um, at the end that does uh, involve our certification offerings. So stay, stay tuned for that. But uh, as far as certifications for webinar attendance, uh, no, we don't, we don't offer those. All right, well, we have a question here that says, I'm ready with an exclamation point. It's, it's, a, it's a great question, um, but I, I think that uh, addresses itself. Okay. Uh, so what is the surprise for the previous webinar? Well, if I gave the surprise for the previous webinar, you'd know the surprise for this webinar. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to wait and see. Okay. So what we're gonna do uh, now is pull up our Meta Defender Core platform. A little, little bit of a backstory for what I have. This is a virtual machine uh, right now running a lightweight version of our Meta Defender Core software. Our Meta Defender Core software, for those of you that aren't familiar, is our primary uh, scanning uh, solution for handling files. A lot of what we do at OpsWat is finding ways to secure your attack surface area in your organization, meaning uh, malicious USBs, malicious emails, um, uh, potentially harmful web traffic, all of those things need to get scanned in some way to be flagged to, uh, if those files are malicious or not. And the workhorse of that is Meta Defender Core. So we're gonna be using this as a standalone um, lab item right now, and it's just the Meta Defender Core platform. So let's just do a quick, easy demonstration um, of the platform itself. So right now we're looking at the dashboard. This is the dashboard of the Meta Defender Core platform. And let's scan a file. Now this, this um, use case that we're going through now is really not how it would be used in an enterprise solution but this UI is a nice way to represent what's actually happening. Um, so you can see I uploaded a TXT file. I scanned it. Uh, there's This is a, a lightweight version that we're using for this virtual machine. So there's only got four engines. Uh, we can have more than 30 engines um, for, for deployments. We have uh, uh, content disarm and reconstruction, which is a fantastic technology um, that will take apart all the various components of a file and remove anything that could be potentially harmful and then rebuild the file back into a functional state. And the reason why this is so fantastic is because even if there's a new uh, uh, type of malware that's been released into the wild, the fact that we are rebuilding the file into a known safe state means that even zero day threats, unknown malware, uh, cannot persist through this type of treatment of files. And yes, the file at the end of the process is not technically the same as the one at the beginning. If you have things like macros inside of Excel files, uh, those will be removed. The macros will no longer be functional, but it gives you that layer of security and certainty um, from that deep CDR process. We're not gonna go through all of the various things that the Defender can do. We, we would easily use up the entire hour um, of just going through these elements, but I do wanna show you what the UI experience really is, uh, just so you can get a sense of what the product is doing. 
I uploaded a file. It's performing all of these various actions on it, uh, checking for um, uh, malware, signatures, sanitization, vulnerability assessments. And let's look at this even further because this, it's the, it's the uh, very intuitive aspect of Meta Defender Core, which is the multi-scan, uh, the, the, the Meta-Scan engine, which uses multiple antivirus engines that many have probably heard of before. Once again, this is the lightweight version only using four, but it's still uh, effectively scanning with four different uh, vendors, antivirus companies, um, anti-malware engines. So according to four of these companies, uh, there is no threat detected in this file, which there shouldn't be. It was just a simple TXT file um, that didn't have any malicious components within it. Now, looking at those T TXT files, I also want to show you this TXT file. For those of you that aren't familiar with, with, with what this is, this is an ICAR string. Uh, this is used for antivirus engines to uh, test the uh, efficacy or uh, to test a positive result for malware. So this is technically isn't anything harmful for my machine. Um, I actually still have to turn off the real-time protection in order to have this file on the desktop. Otherwise, a Windows Defender will yank this right out and I can't use it for testing. Um, but for all intents and purposes, according to an anti-malware engine, this is a sample of malware. So let's go ahead and just scan that and see the difference between the clean result that we just had and this ICAR test file, just so we can get a sense of what a malicious file is. So you can see already all four of these engines did what they were supposed to do. They identified it correctly for what it was. It's a test file, but still for all intents and purposes for how this product would treat uh, an infected detection of a file, uh, it, it, it was able to flag all of those elements. Now, for those of you that aren't necessarily familiar with the way that uh, our products work and the, and the way that this enterprise scanning solution works, you may have noticed I scanned the file, but nothing, nothing happened to it. It's still here. It's still sitting right on my desktop. You know, what's the, you know, wh what do I get out of scanning that? Is it just for analysis? Is it just for getting more information? And that's really where you can start furthering the conversation of how do I get that kind of technology into a specific workflow? How do I get my protection practices that I want to employ to have that result and take action depending on what the result is. So for example, uh, we can imagine for a moment that um, the product, the Meta Defender kiosk does not exist. It, it does, but just, just for uh, just the sake of this conversation, let's imagine that that product does not exist. And you have a very specific uh, use case where you are charged with protecting. Uh, you are you are a cybersecurity expert at a uh, nuclear facility, and you are charged with ensuring that every single USB uh, that is brought into the network has to be scanned and validated to be clean in order to be brought into the secure network. And you know that there is an extremely effective scanning solution that as long as you get the file to it, you can get a very accurate result for uh, whether or not that file is uh, malicious or uh, clean. Well, you could then build something. You could build something that communicates, right? Now we're tying back into this language of cybersecurity. You can build something that communicates with the scanning platform and gives you that result back. And then now it's your decision to decide what you want to do with those with those infected or allowed files. In our case, if we're building some kind of USB scanner, maybe remove the files that were detected as infected and, and continue to keep those files that were allowed. Now, luckily, OpsWat does have a kiosk solution, which does all of these things um, and much, much more. But that is an example of where a lot of our other solutions 
uh, why they exist, because they solve those, those use cases and they solve those um, uh, challenges of getting files from some kind of workflow into this scanning solution. So let's do a, another exercise here on what that would actually look like from a communication standpoint. But before I jump into that, I do want to catch up on our messages just to make sure that there aren't any questions. Okay, maybe it's too early for my question, but I want to ask, does Opswat have any plans for a native web solution instead of ICAP? Um, Opswat actually has a lot of integrations with Nginx web servers. Um, so there's lots of information you can find um, online at docs.opswat.com um, or other elements if you're looking to implement a uh, native web ser server scanning support as well, if that's what you're looking for. So great question. Uh, can we have a recording of this? Yes, all of our recordings um, are free to access at Opswat Academy or learn to Opswat Academy .com, uh, and you will get a email um, once it is posted and able to be accessed. So even if there's a piece that you missed or potentially uh, network issues for a certain section, you can go back and uh, watch those as well. Um, uh, yes, it, it's a free webinar, so you can rejoin from any any device if you need to step away. You're not locked into your current session as well. Uh, let's see here. Okay, please let me know acronyms of API. Thank you. Uh, continue, continue to call call out those things. That's exactly what the, what the purpose of this is. I want to introduce the concepts of of these acronyms and these jargons, and it gets it it's. Um, especially in the academy education aspect of OpSWAT, uh, even for me trying to be very mindful of explaining the various components, we get lost in the jargon all the time. Uh, API for what we're looking at today uh, stands for uh, Application Programmable Interface. Uh, well, really what, what does that mean? It just means that there is some kind of mechanism within the application that allows information to be shared with it or taken from it. And that information can make changes on the application uh, or it can request information from the application. Um, the analogy that I use in the uh, Opsod Academy uh, session, very high level, um, is you can think of the difference of uh, being able to change the, the fundamental code of an application versus interacting with its API as the API being akin to something like a, uh, a drive-through um, fast food window, where you have a list of different things that you can order. Sometimes you can change them a little bit if you want to alter what kind of side you have, but ultimately you have a set range of, of items that you can order. And you can think of those as the various API endpoints. I want this piece of information. I want to change a little bit of that. Um, this is it's kind of a way that you can, can imagine how you interact with, with an application with an API. It's, it's the application's drive-through window, essentially. It's not, it's, it's not going to tell you every single thing about the application. It's going to tell you these things, and you can interact with those things. Um, and, it, and once you request it, you don't, you know, you don't see what, what happens in the background. You don't see how the, how the hamburger is made. But once you ask for the hamburger, you get the hamburger at the end of the exchange. So that's, that's a little bit of analogy that I, I like to use when we're talking about interacting with APIs. Great question. Um, let's see. Are there any systems using wait or voting for file check? Uh, yes, we, we have a several systems that we were using here at OpSWAT. Um, at our publicly uh, available metadefender.com, uh, files that can be uploaded there also have a community component where they can be voted on as uh, indeed malware or actually clean, which is great for initiatives of identifying false positives as well. Um, sometimes there can be similarities in the structure of a legitimate file that people are using for their own applications or for other reasons. 
that gets flagged as malware because it happens to be similar enough to some of those functionalities. Um, at the same time, there's also fantastic uh, sandbox initiatives that we have uh, at OpsWat for um, so many different use cases. And we're not going to be diving into the sandbox analysis today, but the the idea of uh, weighting the probability of uh, of malware versus a standard scam result is a fantastic way to uh, help organizations deal with unknown malware and zero day threats. So with a malware sample that's already been identified by an antivirus company, they update their, uh, they're called signature databases, essentially a fingerprint of whatever file uh, is associated with that malware. That's why the scans are so quick because it's essentially matching a existing list of malware samples with what I just provided those four engines to scan. So if it matches uh, any of those signatures, it will give me the result of an infected result. And sometimes it can take, you know, a few milliseconds for like a text file or an Excel file, depending on how many components it has to analyze and how those individual engines analyze those files. But really what adds more time for scanning is when files are complex or archived. So if it's a zip file, the zip file needs to be extracted. Those components need to be individually analyzed because if we don't analyze each component individually in just the top layer, as we call it, then we're not really getting an accurate result of, of that file. So that's a, that's a great question. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and move forward with the example. So let's do an example of interacting with the API. So we're going to pull up something here. Um, for some of you, this is going to be very familiar. For some of you, this is going to be a brand new concept. And we're going to be looking at uh, the API documentation for Meta Defender Core. And if you haven't ever seen API documentation before, uh, it might look a little daunting, but it's actually very simple. That's a very simple way to follow along uh, with how we're going to be interacting with the Meta Defender Core API. Really, um, at, the, at, at the starting point, we have uh, a API endpoint. Well, what is the endpoint? Well, essentially, it's the, in this case, because we're interacting with Meta Defender Core's web server, it's the web server URL that we're going to be talking to. And when we're talking to that web server URL, we're going to be giving some kind of um, uh, conditions with what it is that we want it to do. And we have to follow in line with uh, what this endpoint expects us to provide. So once again, let's, let's go back to the, the analogy. Uh, this is the, I'm ordering a hamburger. And these are the options. Do I want, you know, extra mayo, or do I want um, lettuce? You know, essentially things like that. But most of the time, you know, you just have the option. If you don't want to make any changes, you just order the. I want the number one, right? I want the the, the burger, and then they're not going to ask you any additional questions. And you'll see that that's actually with. You see a lot of information here, and most of it is optional. Most of it is optional information for different kinds of things that we might want to do. And I think this will make more sense when we uh, when we look at it. So let's pull up an application here. This application is called Postman. Uh, this is not an OpsWat application for those that are not familiar with Postman. This is a uh, widely available tool. A lot of people use this. It's essentially a way to interact with um, uh, with API endpoints uh, that you typically can't really do with just using your browser. When using, when using your browser, you are um, uh, requesting the web page information for your browser to present to you. If you want to see something like um, a, a you know, different form of data, 
uh, or, or provide information in the request to the web page, you're going to need something like, um, like Postman in order to do that. So let's just show a simple example here. We're going to follow along with what this uh, API endpoint is telling us to do. It's giving us a, a post, it's telling us to do a post request and a file. And I scrolled down a little bit on this page, but you'll also see in the documentation that it clearly states uh, in order to define what your input will be, you're basically just doing the uh, URL of, or I did, the, the uh, URL identifier of what your MetaFender core web server is. So in this case, I have this port forwarded on my VM. Uh, so I can actually type in localhost here. And it's the same thing as just saying, I'm pinging the web server that exists on my current machine. Um, essentially, it's, a, it's the loopback address. And then importantly, we need to define what port it's listening on. So where does MetaDefender Core run? It runs on the port. And if actually we can look back here at this, let's go back to login. This is not required. Look at this. This is simply that same URL. This is how I'm accessing this MetaFender Core web server. It's on the just localhost 8008. So this loopback address, this is the port. Everything is operating off of this port. This is the port of the application. And we can do the very same thing as here. So right now, there's really nothing different outside of this, uh, this type of request that we're, that we're promoting. Usually with post requests, it's expecting you to input some kind of information and we will do that in just a moment as well. So we are going to do the rest of the endpoint request, which is, as we saw in the, I don't know where the window is right now, but, oh, you know, I don't know if this is being shared. Let me double check. Yep, I see the comments now. The postman is not being shared. Okay, let me redo that. Share screen, entire screen. That was the issue. OK, I apologize for those technical difficulties there. But now you should be seeing this screen. Uh, and let's jump back really quickly. We are we're also talking about this uh, API documentation. I was mentioning that this is the API documentation um, that we were showing before in the past. And this is where we talk about things like this is the, the order of the burger. These are the, the sides and the options. A lot of these are, are not necessarily needed, um, but we are using these as the endpoints. So this is the A API documentation before. So I hope you all can see my screen now. I uh, apologize for that, but now I can see that it's properly showing up in the window. So we're going to be walking through this uh, together. So this is the... Um, the Postman application, like I was mentioning before, and now you can actually see my screen and see the interface. Uh, we're going to be essentially doing a following along with what the API documentation is saying in the slide. So this is a post request, uh, and it wants us to go to the slash file endpoint, right? So we're going back to the Postman application. Uh, we're going to put it as a post request, and we are going to the slash file endpoint. Now, what is it actually expecting us to deliver here? Well, here we are giving the Meta Defender Core application a file to process. Okay, so with that, we can actually go to the body of the request, um, and we'll just simply choose binary to select the file. And let's go ahead and just upload a file from my machine, and we'll give it this. Uh, you know, let's do a yeah, the X, X, Excel file works. We'll go ahead and open that up to select it, and we can send it away. Now, you can already see here, this is the response. This is the response that the MetaDefender Core application gave me. So to emulate what essentially is occurring is it's the same action as if I was on this application here in the interface, 
and I chose the file and I decided to click it and open. And then I hit process. Now what happens is when I hit process, you get the you, you get the response back, you get the upload, you get all those things. But with the API, we have to handle that ourselves. And how do we handle that ourselves? Well, the first thing that Meta Defender Core does is give us a data ID. And it's the only thing that it does. So why is that? Why is it not just giving us all of the information? Well, as I mentioned before, depending on the kind of material, uh, the kind of files that we're sending, might take some time for that scan process to happen. And when we are uploading this file, we want to get some kind of response back to know that it successfully received our file. And due to the nature of the way that um, these, these post requests um, are, are sending the information, it's not going to keep that connection open. We don't want it to keep that connection open, waiting for that response back to give us the scan result. Because it could be, if it's a, for example, a, a installer file, like a MSI file, those can have tens of thousands of recursive files within them. If we allow core to extract everything, we could be waiting for minutes at a time. And we, we want core to go ahead and start handling the content and then get that information when it's ready. So how do we get the information when it's ready? Well, now we gave core this this file. And now we have the data ID of the file. If we go back and look at the documentation, we can actually see that to get the result information, it's basically the exact same thing we were just looking at with the data ID. And the data ID is provided right here in this previous request. And we switch it to a get request. Um, this does not need to be in the body anymore. It doesn't really matter what the body is with, the, with this get request because it's not processing it. So we can send this. And now we get all kinds of wonderful information about this file. Now this, uh, for those of you not familiar, this format that this is listed in, this is JSON format. And JSON format is an excellent example of a language uh, style that's really common in the industry. It's great because it's it's easy to read for human beings, and it's also not too difficult to um, create programs that interact solely by parsing and manipulating JSON objects. So it's a it's a really good balance between being able to look at this as we are right now and getting useful information, and also building my own applications uh, that can talk to this and cycle through um, what's provided here. So you can see if we look at some of these um, uh, some of these data points here, you can see that the overall detected was allowed. Uh, the progress percentage 100 is an important thing that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, there's no threats detected and we can continue to scroll down. We can even go, go find there's all kinds of information. We can find information by each individual uh, antivirus engine as well. So let's see if we can go down and find that. There we go. There we go. So this is the uh, NLAB result, a Vera result. It tells us how long it took to scan. There's all kinds of information that we get just from uploading this single scan result. Now, if I wanted to build an application, that used this, then there's a few ways that I would be able to handle that, um, especially for files that might take a little bit longer to scan, such as deep recursive archives. The biggest one to look at uh, would be this progress percentage. So if I requested this endpoint here before the file was completely scanned, uh, this progress percentage would not be 100%. So I can make logic within my own application that says, I'm going to ask for this data ID. And if the uh, progress percentage is not 100%, then I would like it to ask again in 10 seconds, right? So that's some, some, some logic that we can use. So let's go through some, some fun things that we can look at 
just just for experiment's sake on how we can interact with this API with things readily available for us, things that you don't need Visual Studio Code or anything to interact with. And this would be actually a good time for me to catch up on our questions. Let's see if we have anything new. Let's see. OK, I don't see anything quite new yet. So let's go ahead and move forward. All right. so. Um, Let's go through a hypothetical example. Uh, the company that I work for um, has just put me in charge of forensic analysis of, um, of files because I'm part of a security response team and I am going through my machine to check for analysis results. We're going through... Uh, there's a lot of holes in this scenario because of what we're uh, uh, about to do, but just just bear with me here. The, the whole idea is that we can really do we can do anything with um, with wanting to find a way to integrate with Meta Defender Core. So, for example, um, what about if I wanted to? You can see if I right click this file. I have all of these op options depending on in the context menu, depending on what I want to do. I can open with something, uh, 7-zip, I can extract them. Um, I can have this scan with Meta Defender, which is exactly what we're going to emulate. What if I wanted to scan with more than Meta Defender? What if I wanted to scan the file with you know, all four engines? Or if I had a full, you know, a full enterprise version of installation of, of core rather than the lightweight four version, you know, 30 or more engines. What if I wanted to right click a file and do that? Well, we could easily do that. You can it, it, just using things that aren't, um, you know, aren't even external applications. This is just a batch file, uh, which is, this is one of the, the, the this is one of the first things I, I wrote for um, interacting with core. It actually creates a PowerShell file and um, the PowerShell file is what is what runs the actual scan. So a lot of this is creating the PowerShell file. Uh, I wrote it this way because I thought it was easier to distribute to my colleagues, but um, it's a, I, I would definitely do it differently in the past, but it's still a fun thing to kind of go back and, uh, and express that even if you are using very simple components, such as the Windows command line, um, and you are using PowerShell to interact with core, there's still things that you can do. Uh, so the whole idea here is that we are going to run this bash file, and it's going to give us the ability to right-click and scan uh, any file. And what's actually happening to that? Well, let's let's look at this one more time. I don't really like to look at it because it's so old. Uh, but what's actually happening is there's just essentially it's going to do a uh, invoke rest method. So it's basically what we were doing with with um, the Postman application, and it's going to feed in whatever file we right click. It's also then going to wait for uh, the scan result and then give the result when it is done. Uh, there is a, uh, it'll continue to look for that progress percentage. Um, otherwise, it'll just say processing. It'll sleep for three seconds for every time uh, that it doesn't complete it. So. Let's go ahead and just run this and uh, hope it works. So run as administrator. Yes. What is the uh, IP and port? We can do local host 8008. All right, we have our new feature. So does this work? There it is. We have this brand new context menu item that is interacting with that API, just like we showed in Postman, but now it's doing it from here. So I'm scanning with Meta Defender Core. Let's see what happens. It's uploading, it's processing, and it gives us the result. Excellent. So we get the whole JSON format uh, information here, or at least most of it. Um, and from here, we can, you know, we could have altered this script a little bit to give us a more concise result. Uh, letting us know 
that the file was just simply allowed or how long it took to scan um, or anything of those natures. But you can see right here, uh, the result is allowed. Now we can do the very same thing with the like our file. And it's processing and you can see that the result is blocked. So there we go. We have a fully functional um, integration using the Windows context menu uh, that interacts directly with this API. And this is just a very simplified version of how you can really use this API to, to do anything. Now, if I wanted to, I could make an uh, update to the script to say, OK, well, if it's blocked, then delete it, right? I could easily do that. Now I have something on my, on my machine um, that can automatically delete files uh, if it discovers that that file is blocked. But right now, this just is giving us information, uh, the same, very same information from the JSON request that we saw, just an essentially an easier way uh, to do that. So that is one fantastic way. And another important item to consider here is this uh, result response time frame. The result response time frame can vary depending on the use case uh, and what kind of um, files you're uploading. So if you have something like a one terabyte um, a drive that you're scanning and it has all kinds of zip files um, that have loads and loads of data in there, all of which are deeply recursive. And you configure your scanning your scanning uh, workflow from Metafinder Core to scan all of those elements, then it's going to take a while. And we don't want to be sitting there pinging and pulling uh, to see what that progress percentage is all the time. So another way that we can address that is to set up something called a webhook. And a webhook is an excellent uh, alternative to the polling style. The polling style being, OK, if it's not ready, let me wait a little bit longer. If it's not ready, let me wait a little bit longer. Uh, instead, it just I send the file to, to core, and then I just wait for it to tell me a response back. And that way, I'm not constantly asking if it's ready or not. I just can wait for uh, a response myself. And let's go ahead and look into what some of that looks like. And first, I will quickly check on our messages. So what platform or application are we seeing? Um, we are looking, right now, this is just a Windows machine running OpSwat software called Meta Defender Core, which is our scanning solution. And with the right click, that's simply just PowerShell. That's Windows PowerShell. That's on every single um, Windows machine. So anybody can, can start using PowerShell and interacting with APIs. It's a fantastic way to um, you know, get started. I would recommend if you want to start working with APIs to use Python as a starting scripting language. Um, but PowerShell is there, and you don't need to install anything, and it works. So um, also, if you're in a more of an IT-oriented role and you need something to run a particular uh, script or function, there's no prerequisites. Uh, you can write a PowerShell script, and it'll just work on your machines. So there's, there's pros and cons to it. The, the language, the the, the, the shell itself, some of the commands can be a little wonky compared to some cleaner languages, um, but it is a, an excellent tool for uh, IT scripting. And using it as an example that, yeah, even with PowerShell, you can easily create something simple and functional um, to interact with cores. It, it's, it's, it's a good uh, indication that really you can use this API endpoint JSON interaction with so many different scenarios. And that's what really kind of ties into the centralized conversation about this webinar is this language of cybersecurity, right? We just looked at a web application running on this machine um, that really, you know, the, the Metafitter core can also be Linux based. So 
there's no Windows requirements to have that API endpoint available. And we're using something completely disjointed being a Windows scripting language to communicate with this API to then do something that we want, which is get a result of a file on my desktop. And so with that simple interaction, we just spoke a language. We just spoke an integration. Very, very simple one, mind you, yes. But it does demonstrate how, how that uh, simplicity can sometimes lead to really intuitive or creative ways uh, that you can find to integrate with the security solutions. And that might be from one security solution to another security solution. You might have an existing security workflow. Um, for example, if you have a, a, a very specific uh, data loss solution. I mean, we have data loss prevention modules in Meta Defender Core, but let's say that you have a very specific data loss solution and there's an, a mechanism in there to do some kind of handoff or results for malware analysis as well. Um, sure, I could come up with other examples, but essentially the handoff nature, that that communication nature can often be done through um, a, APIs. And when you have this communication that's able to be processed and managed, either from a centralized solution talking to multiple other products or from other products uh, themselves, then you have this ability to synergize. And the fact that um, our APIs are represented in JSON, most APIs today are, it's, it's very common. It's, um, um, it's, it's a great way, like I said before, to have uh, an interface or uh, some kind of representation of the data that is human readable and easily machine readable as well and pro programmable. Let's see, uh, what other platforms or apps used to run this API information search. So the application that we used uh, to do the, uh, if, you, if you missed the Postman demonstration, this is called Postman. This is not an OpSwap product. Anybody that is interested in any API, uh, I highly recommend using this because this is a very human friendly uh, interaction because you actually have to choose physically what you're doing. I have to choose to do a post request. I have to choose to add uh, this part to the endpoint. I have to physically click the send button. It's not all happening like it would with a script. So it gets you familiar with what these um, these API endpoints are they're expecting um, and, and how to um, visualize, for lack of a better word, what you're implementing into some kind of some slightly more automated integration like we saw with the script. The script itself is still, you know, a very simple interaction, but it is automated. And with Postman, you get it's a great introduction to to those elements as well. Um, I want to get to the last demonstration. And Let's see if we can get that in time. We have 10 minutes left. So let's do a another quick exercise here. This is a just another PowerShell script. This is not actually interacting with Meta Defender Core. Uh, but what this will do is it just creates a webhook listener, meaning it's just waiting for responses. Um, or requests uh, from something like this. Uh, so what it's going to do is it's going to wait for me to send it some kind of HTTP request. And we can actually represent that with, uh, you know what, let's skip, let's skip the representation and let's go ahead and just give it a test with Meta Defender Core. So what do I expect out of this? I expect that when I scan a file and going into the analyze, we're going to provide a callback URL. As I mentioned before, this is the endpoint that we just discussed, which is posting a file. And these are all of the additional options that we have. 
And one of the additional options is providing a callback URL. And that callback URL is going to send the response that we got, the same response that we got here with our Git request to whatever URL we decide to send it. And I'm going to be running that PowerShell script to listen on a very specific port, and we're going to send it to that specific port. So let's see if we can get this to fire up. We're going to do the callback URL. We're going to pull up our postman. We're going to get this back to the right endpoint, which is file, post, raw. We're going to select the file, binary, excuse me. Select the file. We'll just do the same one. And we now need to go to headers. So in the header, we're going to give it a callback URL. And the callback URL is going to be HTTP colon slash slash localhost. And we set that, I think, to 5,000. Let's set this to 5,001. And we'll change that as well, just in case there's no conflicts from any of my tests. And I think that's correct. This is going to listen on 5001. This is going to send to 5001. And that should do it. So let's go ahead and fire off fire off the script, get it to start listening. OK, so it's listening. And let's send the response or the request. And look at that. I sent the request to MetaFender Core to scan the file. And as soon as it was done, it gave me the entire result here on my listener. Now, mind you, it's, it's a block of data. And if I was really using this for myself to read, I would set this up in pretty print. Um, but this, this block of data is actually the same um, as, as this. The same result request. It's the exact same, just not with the nice spacing. So we can, um, you know, we know that this webhook listener actually worked. So I set up something to listen for that response. I sent the file to core, and as soon as the file uh, finished, it sent the response here. And we're doing all of this stuff, you know, with 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 just PowerShell, with just things that every Windows machine essentially has um, to start. So. You know, this is a, a, a great example of, of how you can learn to play around with a lot of these different communication mechanisms uh, that allow you to move toward more advanced concepts. If I have an intrusion prevention system uh, and I need to send to um, a SOC team or if you're using syslog, syslog is the same kind of communication um, ideas here where now I have events and I want to log all those events. Well, what if I have a scan result and I want to now send a webhook somewhere that's going to process to check to see if that scan result is blocked and then perform some kind of action? Then I want my, my logging system to go off. So there's so many branching paths and so many different opportunities uh, that you have to integrate with Meta Defender Core just from it being there to scan files, just from it being being a, a destination and a source of information about results. I give files to Core for the destination information, and I get and I take the results back and I can use those however I want. And that really is this language that how we're we're incorporating such a flexible platform to integrate with so many other things. It could be someone else's website. I mean, application security is a huge um, focus for us at OpsWatt. And if my application is a web application, you could have those exact interactions that we just showed, either the webhook call or the upload, uh, simply by integrating your web application with MetaFender Core in that way. 
so there's so many avenues for protection that we can utilize. And yes, these small scripting examples are not typical use cases, but they do help explain for somebody that isn't working in uh, a you know, full stack a web developer that now needs to do some kind of security connection uh, to those applications to see uh, at a basic fundamental level how those communication elements are happening. And before we run out of time, I'm going to go ahead and just check a couple questions here. Let's see. All right, is there any API call limit for a testing purpose? So what we had was a local installation of Meta Defender Core. Uh, if you are interested in uh, the product itself from your business perspective, outside of just learning uh, from the you know training certifications perspective, if you are a, a potential client, uh, then you can contact the uh, our Opsos sales team. And if you need a test key, you can get a test key. The test keys for the local installations do not have any API limits that um, you would need to worry about because it's your server running that web server. So any any overloads are due to the network overload rather than API rate limiting. When you are interacting with our our infrastructure for the metadefender.com, the cloud metadefender cloud service, then because that's a publicly available service, yes, those do those are subject to rate limiting as well. So it depends on your use case. It depends on how you want to interact with it. Um, if if it's a it seems like a viable uh, product for your organization and you want to explore evaluating it, I uh, highly recommend reaching out for a test key uh, to test drive the product. Let's see. And eligibility, I am not from an IT background. Well, that's that's perfect because this is what we're uh, we're trying to uh, connect to. Uh, the, the excitement and fun of cybersecurity for even those that haven't really been in the cybersecurity field before. Uh, None of these things that that you know we're we're, we're showing are gated off, um, outside of being able to use the the Meta Defender platform itself. But there are a lot of other services that you can interact with that have uh, that have their own API endpoints that you can play with. So once you find any kind of service that you're trying to interact with that has an API, and if you work for some kind of uh, uh, business, there's probably all kinds of applications that that um, already have interfaces that might not be used. Um, then you can find ways to connect those things together. There, it's a great tool to. There, it's a great process to integrate your different solutions. Uh, let's see. And I think, from what I can tell, those are all the questions that we have. Um, and we got one minute left, so I want to give the special announcement. Uh, for the next seven days, we are going to have a special uh, promo code for all of the attendees at this event. So we offer our certification uh, paths at opswatacademy.com. So if you head to learn the opswatacademy.com, then you can use this promo code, which I will post in the chat. The promo code is language. And this promo code will be live for use about five minutes after this event and will be uh, able to be used up to seven days. And then we're going to post the recording of this webinar seven days uh, from now. That way, those that see the recording uh, don't get this exclusive offer. This is just for you guys. This is just for hanging out uh, this whole time. And you'll be able to uh, go to the OpsiteAcademy.com and get 75% off any course of your choice, um, actually any purchase of your choice for the associate courses. And the associate courses go through and break down a lot of these concepts like I just showed today, but we have uh, intuitive diagram format rather than uh, me showing you the, uh, the the straight up API documentation. So uh, check that out at opswatacademy.com. And uh, I hope you all enjoy our content and enjoyed this session.
So thank you all for coming today. I look forward to seeing you guys next month. Hopefully you make it and have a good one.